system, and it's increasingly difficult to be able to find and, and have healthy food. It seems like it's such a challenge with uh, time and with uh, the resources to be able to have healthy food. And, this, and there's a lot more people that are dealing with health issues because of food um, in our society. Can, can, can we all know somebody with uh, health issues related to food? Yeah, yeah. right. <laughs> and how many times do we know people that have allergies or have issues with diabetes or even heart disease and cancer? We can all trace a lot of that back to food. So this is my family. I kind of put this up here for my own benefit, really. But <laughs> um, this is my sweet granddaughter, Eve. And just in case you didn't get a good, good close look at her, this is her. <laughs> and that's me holding her. It was so amazing. She's so sweet. So my goal of this last uh, visit with her, I saw her when she was just a baby. This was just a few days after she was born last Thanksgiving. So she's almost a year exactly right now. Um, her and her husband got sealed in the temple. This is her at the ceiling that we went to, it was awesome. And then um, my goal, because she was kind of having that, uh, what do you call it, uh, just afraid, afraid your danger, right? So my goal this, this time was to get her to let me hold her. And um, I was able to get her to not only let me hold her, but we, we were connected for about two or three hours. And when I had to give her up, she wailed like a champ. So oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, So this, this was, is really what it's all about. It's about our families, and that's the reason why things like tonight matter, because what we put in our bodies does matter. How many of you have noticed that when you eat unhealthy food, it affects your mind? Mm -hmm. And how about your energy levels? Mm -hmm. And how about your mood? Mm -hmm. Do you think that would also affect, if there's anyone that needs to come in, we've got some chairs. Does uh, Brother Latham, do you want to go ahead and, yep, more. perfect, Brady, do you guys want to help with uh, setting up some more chairs? Please come on in. Please come in. So we know that it affects us. And what kind of toll is that taking on our ability to connect with our loved ones, to be able to serve our purpose in this life, to be able to have that enjoyment of life, right? So we only have today, every day that we have is gone tomorrow, right? And so today becomes yesterday, and the life we want to live has a lifestyle attached to it, and that's what today is about. So why do we care? Most illnesses in the, in the U.S. are preventable. Um, regulating agencies are now staffed with employees of the companies that they're supposed to be regulating. Who sees that as a conflict of interest? <laughs> Definitely uh, is a conflict of interest. Profit is being put over the health of the people, and the U.S. has repeatedly been shown to be one of the least healthy of all industrial nations in the, in the world. So we'll talk about this in a minute. There's food, there's additives in our food that are really harming us, literally uh, killing us slowly making us dependent upon medications, etc. So a small sample, uh, a small um, sample of scripture, uh, because, you know, why would bread be bad for you, right? Why are so many people having gluten issues? Um, give us this day our daily bread. That's in the Lord's Prayer, right? Um, Matthew 4, 4, man shall not live by bread alone. Uh, Matthew 26, 26. Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after he blessed it, he broke it, and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. Obviously, bread is an important component of our health, right? It's scriptural as well. It's been eaten for thousands of years. I am the bread of life. Whoso cometh to me shall not hunger. Uh, go, eat your bread with joy. So we've got these... Uh, come on, baby. You can do it. I know it. <laughs> so we've got these scriptural examples. If I do it a lot, maybe it'll... Okay. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, maybe that's what it is. Okay. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I give him is my flesh, which I give for the life of the world. The Savior chose to use bread as an analogy for the sacrifice that he made for us to give us life and joy and hope. And that's what it's really all about, right? So there's spiritual health by coming to, by coming to Christ. <laughs> by implementing his gospel in our lives, by repenting. But there's physical health with bread, but it's got to be real bread. And to be quite honest with you, the bread in the store today is franken bread. It's not real bread. Okay? This know ye that in the last days perilous times shall come. Men shall be lovers of their own selves, controls, covetous. I'm going to skip down. Um, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But continue thou in that which thou hast learned and hast been assured knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Uh, from that, uh, and that from a child thou hast known that the Holy Scriptures which are able to make thee wise into salvation through faith 
which is in Christ Jesus. Yes. <laughs> Word of wisdom, right? Doctrine and Covenant, section 89. Behold, verily, verily, the Lord, thus saith the Lord unto you, in consequence of evil designs, um, which do and will exist in the hearts of conspiring men in the last days, I have warned you and forewarned you by giving this word of wisdom by revelation. Right? So I want to want to help make sure I think we all know that there's evil designs of conspiring men in these last days. So this is why we're here. This is why we have the predicament that we have. We cannot abdicate our health to someone else who's the only one that can be in charge of it. Part of that, the first part of that is learning. We have to have uh, understanding, okay? So when it comes to bread itself and grain, all grain is ordained for the use of man and of beasts to be the staff of life, not only for man, but of beasts of the field, etc. All food, all grain is good for man um, and the fruit of the vine, which yieldeth thereof. Nevertheless, wheat for man, corn for the ox, oat for the horse, rye for the fowl, etc. All saints who remember to keep and do these sayings, walking in obedience to the commandments, shall receive health from the navel, marrow in the bones. Now, we all... Most of us know the word of wisdom came out long before a lot of understanding about health, especially with tobacco and alcohol, were understood. Um, at that point, tobacco and alcohol were thought to be beneficial for you, um, especially tobacco, right? They were using that as uh, tonics, and now we know how dangerous it is. Um, so it's, it's time-tested. So what the crap is up with bread? <laughs> <laughs> Why are we having issues with bread? Um, my story. This is, yes, there is a video online if you want to see me looking ridiculous. I did dress up as the elf and did the whole Santa. So um, my story is um, I had a naturopathic doctor, actually fun pardon me, functional medicine doctor, come into my office. And I worked with her and I referred patients to her. And she did a blood panel on me that looked at um, everything, uh, far more than you would normally get. And wanted to under identify how my body was doing, was able to identify Hashimoto's disease before it would have shown up on normal panels. And that Hashimoto's disease that I have is a thyroid problem which causes issues with uh, the regulation of my energy levels and other things. So she recommended I get off of gluten and dairy to begin with. I did that for two, uh, about two, three months and started to notice changes in my health that I hadn't expected. One of the changes that I noticed was that I had had difficulty with inflammation in my esophagus and when I swallow food, I would struggle with it getting stuck in my throat. And a couple of times, I'd have to drink water to try to get it to go down. It's a couple times I drank so much water, I almost choked to death. So it's got, got to be pretty serious. What I noticed when I stopped doing those things, my, that health issue went away, and no one could tell me what that was. I know the medical doctors had a, had a medication for it, but I didn't want to use medication because I knew it wasn't actually addressing the problem. It was just masking it, right? So um, I had to go through a period of healing, right? So I, I had to heal my gut. The problem came from my gut. And we'll talk about that in a little bit, of why normal store-bought bread is causing problems with your gut and what you need to do about it, and the solution we're going to talk about <laughs> just a little bit, okay? So that healing of the gut sometimes is really necessary for someone that has a problem with gluten sensitivity like celiac disease or Crohn's disease. Those things, um, it's you have to go through a protocol, preferably with a, uh, a licensed professional <coughs> like somebody who does functional medicine or somebody who does um, naturopathic medicine to help your gut to heal before you introduce this. But the thing was is that I had seen patients that went to Europe on vacation, had no problem eating gluten there, but came back here and had trouble. And I'd also known of people that come from Europe, come here, and then they have problems with gluten for the very first time. Anyone have that experience too? Right? Anyone know of someone? Right? Okay. So why is that? So I wanted to understand. So what I found out, oh, what I found out is that there's a lot of problems with the bread in our, in our society. First of all, it's, it's laden with toxins. There's 33 ingredients in bread. Um, that should not be the case. There's carcinogenics that are banned in other countries like potassium bromate, and glyphosate is the same as Roundup. It's in all kinds of different foods, but in our wheat, um, they actually spray it down about 30 days before harvest to help it dry out faster because it's also a dehydrating agent. That prevents it from, uh, from rotting or getting moldy, but also they can take it right to market really quickly instead of having to dry it out, and it takes a long time. So it's about profit. Right? Remember the evil designs of conspiring men? Um, it's very high glycemic. In other words, when you have store-bought bread, it's going to spike your blood sugar levels up. You want your glycemic level to be 55 or lower. And glycemic means like when you eat something that's really, really sugary and it spikes your glucose levels up, that's what causes problems with your pancreas and leads to issues of diabetes and metabolic syndrome, which is inflammation, and causes much, so much problems. Okay? So that's, that's not good. It's basically like having a spoon full of sugar. Um, and there's enzyme inhibitors that are in the wheat that are still present with the modern way that they uh, produce it. They use a specific kind of yeast that's called brewer's yeast. 
And that yeast is what they use to make beer. Um, it's really fast acting, and so you can get your bread to rise in, in no time at all, which is why they use it. But it doesn't neutralize these enzyme inhibitors like the wild yeast will. And so because of that, it causes problems with the gut, like we talked about earlier. Leaky gut syndrome is like kind of a very layman's way of saying that the gut is no longer protecting you from the food passing through and it leaks into your system, and then your body begins to develop autoimmune issues like I did. And that's also nutritional deficiencies because your body's not able to absorb the nutrition like it needs to as well. Um, inflammatory diseases begin to build in that situation. Your body starts to have more chronic pain. You start to have fogginess and other, other symptoms we'll talk about in a minute. It's also not nearly as satisfying, um, and it's quite expensive when you look at the cost of me making these loaves of bread. Each loaf of bread might maybe cost me $2.50 for the white ones. For the other ones, it was a little more expensive, but it's not a big deal. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> so before you venture, if you do have problems with gluten sensitivity, you would know this by abdominal pain, uh, anemia, anxiety, bloating, gas, foggy brain, concentration issues, depression, diarrhea, constipation, fatigue. Headache, joint pain, nausea, vomiting, skin rashes. How, how many people know someone or have issues like the, this themselves? Okay. Um, one experiment to see if you're gluten sensitive is just stop eating gluten for a few months. And then, after you've done stop eating gluten for a few months, for one day, have gluten at three meals, and then wait for three days and see how your body responds. When you have gluten, you don't necessarily have an immediate response. Some people do. But most people don't have an immediate response. It takes a few days for them to be able to experience the, the side effects. And so that's a great test. Um, so why is it that you're having these symptoms? Well, we kind of already talked about that. And this is the test we just talked about. So really, for people that have really significant gut issues, um, restoring the gut is really important. If you, um, I'll go back so you're not, not tempted to read it. If you, are, if you know you have sensitivity issues, um, and you come tonight and you're like, I don't know if I should eat this bread. My suggestion to you is to take a slice home and then tomorrow eat one, one piece um, in the morning, the afternoon, and the evening, and then wait two or three days and see how your body responds. I would not be surprised, I would use that on the white bread, not the other ones with the others. If you, if you did that, I would not be surprised if you had no trouble with this bread because mm -hmm. of the way that it's made. Okay. So this bread, this is the good stuff. You know, your body has an innate wisdom within it that God put in you to help you to be able to know um, good food when you, when you taste it. And the, the food that you get from the store is designed to, to trick you. Um, and so when you actually get the good stuff, you're like, wow, it's good stuff. So I, I did this whole thing because I started bringing sourdough to sacrament meeting because I needed to do it myself because I knew that it was not going to bother me instead of the, the sacrament bread that I would normally eat. And, and I thought, well, I just might as well bring it for everyone. It's good for everyone. I don't want, like, Frankenbread to be represent the body of Christ, right? So I brought it for everyone, and everyone was like, holy crap, this is good bread. This is why we're here tonight. <laughs> so sourdough bread, it's been made for thousands of years, and there's, really, there's only three ingredients. You can add other stuff to it, but three ingredients. They're simple, they're readily available. Um, it's fermented with wild yeast. If you ever want to make your own starter, you can take a bowl of flour and water, leave it out on the counter with a cover on it for a few days, and it'll start to bubble. You've got wild yeast, you've got your starter. That's all you got to do. It's all around us. In fact, our body has it in us, and when we pass away, there's beneficial bacteria, mostly beneficial bacteria actually, in our body and gut, that is keeping that yeast at bay. When that dies, that's what actually becomes our body's yeast. So, um, when you get a starter, it has different flavors, and some is more yummy than others. And so when someone gets like a really good starter, they're like, oh, this is really good, I love it. So they share it. Right? So this starter that you're getting tonight is 200 years old. And the reason why it's 200 years old is because they liked it so well, they shared it, and they didn't want to let it die. Right? And so after sharing it over and over again, it's actually from Italy. I got it, if you want to have really amazing pizza, from Pizzaiolo. Pizzaiolo went to Italy, took a baking class. He's actually Italian. It's a cool story. And, and they got the starter from Italy and brought it back on. Right? So that's what you guys have. You guys have a starter from Italy. It's awesome. It's also really, really robust. Some starter, it's easier to die, and I'll tell you about how to care for it. It's not hard. It just takes a little getting used to it. Um, it's, the, this bread is low glycemic. If you're concerned about diabetes, it's about 54, 55 glycemic. That is within normal ranges, or healthy ranges for someone that's side out. That's pretty cool, right? Um, it's a good source of many nutrients, um, and that's because the fermenting process unlocks these nutrients, especially when you use good quality flour that hasn't been sprayed down with glyphosate. That's on your 
your uh, recipes. Please make sure. <coughs> um, it's highly anti-inflammatory versus the other that's inflammatory. It's less expensive. Like I said, two dollars and fifty cents is amazingly low. It takes a little bit of time, but it's not that hard. It's very satisfying, and it's also probiotic to the gut, which is opposite of the normal store-bought bread. It actually destroys the gut flora, which is one of the reasons why it's so problematic. Okay. So I'm just kind of did a little bit of like cross comparison here. I won't spend too much time on this slide, but if you want to take a picture, you're welcome to. But this basically is the modern Franken bread versus the ancient sourdough bread. There's it's just like night and day When you go back to the scriptures and you think about the Savior versus the adversary and the imitation that the adversary always tries to have versus the real, good, healthy things, this Frankenbread in my mind and many other things in our diet are just a tool of the adversary because it's leading to addiction, it's leading to chemical dependency, it's leading to death and disease, and it's leading to a loss of people's purpose in life. It's thwarting God's plan in your life. And I'm not trying to say like an evil person for eating bread. Please don't get me wrong with that. But I'm just saying that this type of thing is, an, is can really help you to live a full life. Okay? Now, when we look at... I, I love this slide. I got this from a company that is an awesome chiropractic company. Food by God versus food by man. Right? Food by God is grown in healthy soils. It hasn't been sprayed down with pesticides. Because that there's actually a microbiome within that soil that gives nourishment to those plants, right? Genetically modified foods are grown in a chemical soup, and that, that chemical, like glyphosate, gets into the plant itself. So as you're eating, what you think is healthy, like celery, is loaded with that pesticide. And it's not just that. There's so many other things, right? So not only is it devoid of nutrition, but it's also filled with toxins. The same thing is happening with our needs. We're actually raising cows and raising pigs in very unsanitary, very unhealthy circumstances, they're feeding them genetically modified food. So in as the cow eats that, it gets into the tissues of the animal, and you're eating that too. Now, whenever you eat a toxin, your body doesn't like it, and your liver wants to get rid of it. One of the ways the liver gets rid of it is by putting it in a fat cell, because it's like a little time capsule. And so when you have a lot of, like, you know, a lot of fat in an animal filled with toxin, and then you eat that fat, it's like a little, a little like capsule of toxin is what's happening. That's the reason why grass-fed, and I'm actually okay with grain finish. We just talked about corn for cows, right? I'm okay with grain finish as long as it is non-GMO grain, in my opinion, right? But, um, but we don't want to have these animals that are just laden with stuff. Am I boring to people? I, I, I'm just wanting to see if I got anyone nodding off, so I don't want it to take too long. Um, so this, this is also a really great one to, to understand. It, it really boils down to eating like our ancestors ate and trying to avoid every modern intervention in food that we can. Whenever we have modern intervention in food, it's not good. There's some modern interventions, great. I had a hernia surgery, thank goodness, right? I, I was burned as a kid and it saved my life having the doctors work on me. Awesome, right? Save lives in, in those ways. There's other ways you need to be wise, right? And make sure that you're cautious. Okay, so a brief word about cravings. I just mentioned this a little bit ago, but Chemical dependency from um, from the food industry will cause you cravings. Um, you can use your brain to know when it's really a chemical dependency because you know it's like if I'm craving uh, something that's natural, something that's healthy, like this bread, it's not bad for you. I've had patients that like feel so guilty. Oh, I love that bread so much. I want to eat it all day long. It's probably because your body's deficient in the nutritional value that this bread provides and you should eat it. I hardly ever eat this bread anymore. I, I give it away most of the time. I make so much bread, but I hardly ever have any of it. So I just don't crave it anymore. I don't, I'm not, it's not a big deal for me. Because I've had so much of it already, now my body is satiated. But if you feel the craving for healthy food, eat healthy food. Please do. Right? Like, you've ever, everyone, anyone ever heard of a pregnant ladies eating freeze rice? Anyone ever heard of that? It's called plica. The reason why pregnant, pregnant ladies used to eat freeze rice is because there was lead in the freezer mm -hmm. back in the day. Mm -hmm. And they thought they were getting iron. Okay, so that's, that's an, uh, an example of the body being tripped by, by a chemical, right? And that happens in our modern food all the time. Um, but that body's innate wisdom within you should be able to guide you when you, are, when you are healthy. When you are healthy and you get used to eating healthy foods, you will want the healthy foods. And when you have the unhealthy foods, you're just like, gross. I don't want All right, so basically, does it follow the rules? Is it from nature? So disclaimer... I'm a, pro, I'm a pragmatist, not an analyst, if you know what I mean. Okay. Sorry, I get a little spicy on that. But um, I, 
I, this is a very basic recipe that we're about to go through. I am not some expert on sourdough. I just wanted a, a recipe that was easy because I am working. I don't have all day to like, I, I, I research this stuff and you know the kind of stuff they have you do in some of these recipes? Oh my goodness. Okay, I'm gonna, here we go. Um, I've watched hours of videos, several hundred loaves of bread later. Autolyse, does anyone know what autolyse is? You have to like add the flour in the water and let it sit for a while and then you can start. And then adding the salt later because it might interfere with the yeast rising. And then making sure that you set your timer every 30 minutes and do your stretch and fold. And then making, like, are you serious? Like, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> it's, it's annoying. And I've, I've heard of friends saying, oh yeah, my friend had to leave our little get together because she had to go like do her thing for the bread. Um, this recipe does not do that. Now, will this recipe make the most beautiful bread in the world? No, it's not going to, but it will make the delicious and easy bread. Practical bread. Remember the pragmatist part? So that's what it's for. And the, do you guys like the bread? Yeah. Right? That's, that's, I use this recipe for the bread. Okay. All right, now, um, what was the question? Um, expensive courses, and then no. All that stuff, you don't have to do it. It's not that hard. Not that hard. Okay, so demonstration. So everyone has a recipe. Does everyone have a recipe? No. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and pass out recipes. We also have the starter right here, so we can pass that out as well. If you need a jar, Miss Allison has. You mind just passing it down? You got it down, right? If you need a jar, Miss Miss Allison Whitaker has donated some jars for your starter, so grab one. They're right up here for you. And actually, I will grab it for you. Okay, I need a volunteer. You ready to start? Yeah. Woo! All right. You're going to do it? Okay, come on up. Okay, Miss Allison, you get swear. So we're going to start the demonstration. So the, Allison, thank you very much. This is a this is a nice idea that donated the jars. Thank you very much. Am I the only family? <laughs> Okay, so we have a we have a scale uh, on your ingredients or on your uh, recipe here. You're going to notice that there's my disclaimer, right? It's just for a simple bread, um, and it's broken up into stages. On the back side, we're going to talk about caring for your starter, and we're also we also have um, suggested uh, tools. One of the ones that's really very important is your scale. Uh, the scale, I would say, you kind of have to have it. Um, there's a lot of things you can figure out something else to do, but the scale you actually really need. So we've got our bowl and our scale. So the first thing we're going to go ahead and do is we're going to what we call tear the scale. Or we'll turn it on, it'll be zeroed out. And to tear it, you press this little tear button, which zeroes it out. You guys know this more than I do. I did learn this. The whole tear thing and the scale, but I never did that. Anyway, so the first thing we're going to do is add the water. So we've got some, it's supposed to be filtered water right here. We're going to go ahead and add, and Allison's going to add um, about 700 to 750 milligrams of water. Does everyone see that? Mm -hmm. okay. Grams, pardon me, grams. 750? 750. I just use room temperature water. If you are concerned about it going faster, you can use warm water. Do not use hot water. It will kill your yeast. Yeah, do you see it? Grams. I got it on Amazon. Yep. And it doesn't matter what kind of scale you get. It's what it be like. That's great. Okay. If you do, I'll take just two grams out. Closer to 700 might be easier because it's easier to work with when it's not too moist. Um, when you've kind of, got, kind of gotten good at it, then you can add more moisture to it and it'll rise further. If you can do that. Okay. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to add some salt. So we're going to go ahead and grab the real salt. You guys all know about actual real salt. Okay, we'll, we'll pass it around. This salt is actually from Salt Lake City. Um, there's some land salt. There's also some mineral salt water salt that is like super pristine. So I can pass that around. So it's going to add between 20 to 25 grams of salt. You have to do math. Seven, seven, oh, seven, when I hit tear. So how many yeah. teaspoons is that? What? 
Now, one of the things I want to remind you guys is salt is not bad for you when it's real. It's actually minerals in there. It comes from an ocean, and that's where life, they say, began, right? There's all the minerals that you need in your soil. And this stuff is not nearly, it does not taste salty like if you were using more than salt. Really? good stuff. Do you guys want to pass that around? You can take a look at it. You can pass around this other one, too, if you want. Where did you get it? Um, that one I bought at Rayleigh's today, oh. so I ran out of salt. Um, but if you want to go online, you can get a big bucket of it if you want to be a big, like, salt fanatic like I am. <laughs> big <love bread. coughs> go ahead and use a spoon and stir that around. Some recipes say that you should add the salt after you've let it rise. It's, it's stupid. I, I tested it. All this stuff I tested. I made a loaf one way and I made another loaf another way. I baked them both. There was no noticeable difference between the two. I just went ahead and did it. If you do this, you're not going to get little salt pockets in your bread. It's already dissolved in the water. It's easier. Now, if you use real salt, there's going to be minerals in there, so you might see little specks in your bread. It's not a big deal. It's healthy for you. Just eat it. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. Now, the next thing we add is the starter. Alice, you want to go pull it up and it. Yep, we're going to tear it again. We're going to zero out the scale. So we're going to do about 100 to 150 grams. Does it really matter? No. You can use more, you can use less. If you use more, it's going to rise faster. If you use less, it's going to take longer. If you use starter that hasn't been fed in a while, now this talks about a float test. Now, when Allison puts this in here, it'll float, right? Does the, does the volume change the taste? Like you take put more, put less? Probably makes it a little more sour if you put more. Um, about 150, but that's fine. So it's floating right now. It's because the yeast poops, the parts. That's, that's what makes it float. Okay. So that that uh, that's called the float test. If yours doesn't pass the float test, you're probably going to be fine. You'll probably just still use it. It'll just take longer to, to rise. The yeast is alive. It's a living thing. And when it's active and warm and has lots of food, it gets all excited. And then it makes a lot of gas, and that's what causes it to flow. That's also what causes those air bubbles within your bread. If it's been a while since it's been fed, it kind of gets sluggish and tired, and it's got this, this uh, kind of watery film on the top, use it anyways. So if you want to redo it, that's fine. Yes? <coughs> Yes, and I'll explain that at the end. Yep, we're going to go over how to, how to care for your starter. Okay, so the next thing we're going to do is a 1,000 milligrams of flour. There happens to be a 1,000 milligrams of flour in the bag. Look at the flour. Um, the flour is important. Um, definitely get organic or you're going to be eating glyphosate. Okay? Um, I don't want to eat glyphosate. Do you need sprouted flour? You don't. And here's why. Because the fermentation process, it has the same effect as the sprouting of grain does, which neutralizes those anti-enzymes. And so, go ahead. And did you, did you zero it out? Or did you? I already mentioned it. It's a thousand grams. So, you just don't have to measure it. Yeah. <laughs> so, this, I got this flower actually um, because I'm friends with the owner of uh, Pizzaiolo. I got this flower from him, a 50, 50 pound bag, and it's imported from Italy. This is Caputo's flower, which you eat. But I've also bought flour, organic flour, bread flour from Costco, and it's worked great. Yes. Is it like double zero? Or is it? it is, yes. It's double zero. You can get reds. is great flour, too. Yes? So if you just go for organic flour, are yeah. you doing... Okay. You're good. Organic red flour should be fine. So now, go ahead and stir that up. We're going to go ahead and take that off. And Alan's going to have fun. But do you have the PTO low at the recipe? I don't. Good question. That's a good question. That's a good question. I think that's a secret. What about the red salt? <laughs> what about the red salt? Yeah, it's great. Red, no, the red salt. Oh, red salt? Oh, yeah. <laughs> they can't go in there with a ranch bottle in the hand and they scallop. It. <laughs> so, it just takes a little while to mix. What's that? Yeah. As long as there's no additives in there. If you have additives in there... Is that the only ingredient? 
Yeah, I would want it to be just the pure salt that's from nature, not refined, not messed around with. This is the salt that our ancestors ate. It's a better one. It's actually. <laughs> okay, so what I've already done. So on your on your uh, your recipe, we've just mixed the ingredients. Okay. Now, after you've let it sit for a while, and we're going to do that in just a little bit. After you've let it sit, it's going to start to rise. Now, you're going to do some a technique. It's called a stretch and fold technique. It builds the gluten. It helps it shape and form. It's not too hard to do. It's kind of fun. Let's get the hang of it. There's a couple of ways to do it. I'll show you both ways. But the stretch and fold technique, I, this is a, a, some This is some that I've already done. I've, I've made this uh, earlier today. And the stretch and fold technique is you, you wet your hands, and that will keep it, the dough from sticking on your hands. And then you can grab it from the edge, pull up, and then over. Okay? And then you can bring it, uh, turn it, rotate the pull, up, and over. Okay? And then so you just go to the full circumference of the bowl. That's the stretch and pull. Okay. I don't even know what that is. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. Great. Now there's... Yeah. Now, because I work, um, I will often just do this in the morning time. So I'll do that. Wait about 30 minutes, maybe only 10 minutes because I'm in a rush. And then I'll do the stretch and pull technique. I'll go to work and I'll let it sit on my counter and rise all day. I'll come home. I'll do another stretch and fold or two, and I'll put the fridge and go down. And then I'll bake it in the morning. Mm -hmm. That sounds pretty easy, right? Yeah. It's not hard. It's not hard. Okay? Now, another stretch and fold technique, which is, makes it prettier, if you guys are interested in that, that aesthetics, I like aesthetics, you, you, you can go ahead and scoop it like this. You can let it kind of hang a little bit, and then you, and you go around, do the same thing all the way around it. The idea is I'm building tension, I'm stretching it, I'm pushing to the outside under, just like that. You see? And it makes it look pretty. Okay. What? How much How's does it do? Right? Is it gonna like go over your? your if you do let it rise, you can let it rise too much, and it'll pop the lid off. Oh. And you know, still make it. Still yeah. make it. I I I did. I basically got um, busy, and I I didn't get around to. I first of all, I used some of this bread to make a pizza because I was hungry and I wanted to make a pizza. And so this recipe makes two loaves. This was the this was the recipe that I, I took some out for the pizza so they're small. And I, I got mm -hmm. busy so I left it in the fridge for too long. Mm -hmm. And so they don't <coughs> they're not rising as much. So there's not these ones are not very like filled with holes and such. They're still gonna be delicious. You can use them for croutons, you can use them for like a uh, toast with uh, some jam, so you don't have your jam going through the holes, right? So there's still good things you can do with that. I'll wrap it up in a minute. Can you say you guys like three days? No, yeah, it's definitely wrong. <laughs> so you should only, so on the recipe it says like about five to seven, five to eight hours, but it depends on the, the weather and the temperature in your home. So if you have a warm home, if it's a warm sunny day outside and it's like 80 degrees in your home, it's probably only five hours. That's great. That's great. Now, when when she's done with that, when she's uh, uh, <laughs> um, there's a bowl scraper we can do. Okay, and that's what it looks like. Okay, that's what it looks like. We're just gonna let that sit. The last time I did this demonstration, the person was here the whole. You look like Julia Childs on the camera. Did I? She yeah, was so, a mean so person. This, all this is, all this is, is that a few hours later. Okay? I would say maybe two hours, like maybe five hours later. So this right here, it's going to rise. It's going to bubble. And with this, as it is, I can go ahead and do that stretch and fold with this. Right? Not gonna look very pretty at the beginning, but as you begin to build that gluten, it looks prettier and prettier. It looks more and more like that. That one I've already done, I think, two times, maybe three. So I only go around it once. And I let it sit for another 30 minutes or longer. Like I might go to work and do it at the end of the day. That's fine. 
Um, and then eventually you'll be ready for the next step, which is what we're going to do now. We need to cover it with plastic. We do. Thank you for mentioning that. I have a lid here, right? I have a lid here. That lid is essential, otherwise it will dry out. Now, have I done it where I forgot the lid? Yeah, I still baked it. It still came out decently, right? Okay. So you, you do want to cover it. Um, you can use saran wrap. Um, there is there is different chemicals within the saran wrap, especially if you microwave it, they get into your food, and so there's wax paper that's much better. Um, but because you're not going to be microwaving this saran wrap, probably just fine. Okay. Now the next part on your recipe. Let's go ahead and go down that recipe. So we, we let it rise. Um, we got the boil rise five to five eight hours with the pull and fold or, um, method or the pull and stretch. Now we're going to prepare for the, the cold ferment. Now, if you don't want to do a cold ferment, you don't have to. Um, there's lots of recipes. This, this, the nice thing about this is it gets your feet wet. Then you begin to understand it and you begin to like not be as intimidated by it. And then you can start like using this to make all kinds of other stuff. I've made um, hot dog and hamburger buns with it. Hot dog and hamburger buns are really nice because when you make a hamburger bun, you freeze it. This stuff freezes great. You can freeze a loaf of bread. It, it freezes so well. When you warm it back up in the oven, it's like fresh bread again. It's awesome. So, <clears throat> at any rate, um, you don't have to cold ferment it. There's different um, strains of bacteria and yeast within the sourdough uh, starter. It doesn't need to be sour. Um, I think that sourdough um, uh, name kind of turns people off a little bit. It doesn't have to be sour. You can make all kinds of stuff with it. Has anyone had my, my waffles? Well, they're really good. <laughs> so you can, I made sourdough cookies. Did anyone have my sourdough cookies? Okay. Yeah, two people have my sourdough cookies. So at any rate, um, you can do other stuff with it. If you didn't want it to be sour, just don't put it in the fridge. When you put it in the fridge, it, it, it encourages the strains of bacteria that produce lactic acid instead of acetic acid, and that's going to give you more of that vinegary flavor. Got it? Or maybe reversed. I'm not sure if it's... Doug, which one's vinegar? Is it acetic or lactic Okay, so Doug means... This guy is like so small. <laughs> okay, so um, the cold fer per uh, ferment. This one, this one might take a little practice, and just don't get upset with yourself. It's okay. Um, but we're going to go ahead and do is we're going to pull this out, and I'm putting it on an unfloured surface. It's going to. You guys going to probably want to be like that guy from uh, the Muppets. Borgy, 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 you have flour all over the place. <laughs> you don't want to do any of the flour, and the reason is because it's it's your friend. The, the, the surface not having the flour because it'll be your friend. And so what we're going to do is, first of all, I'm going to divide this in half. This is going to get interesting. This means, can someone volunteer to hold this down for me? Yeah. Okay, so, are awesome. so stand over here so we don't get in the way of the same. This is my grandson's Hi. Yay. So the purpose of this is to build tension on the surface. <clears throat> So first of all, I'm just going to slice. This is called a bench knife, by the way. Um, and I'm going to slice this because this recipe makes two bread, two uh, loaves. I mean, I really like this bench knife because oh, here it is. This one has um, the scraper that goes right in it, and I've got this little hook so I can just hang on, you know, on my uh, kitchen wall. So at any rate, when you're doing this this uh, technique, I'm going to go ahead and scrape it up, and then bring it down this way. I'm actually. I, I think I might be a guy. <laughs> I got you. Yeah. All right, come on over. Come back here, too. I'm sorry, this is a little tricky on this. Uh... Yeah, I should have brought some clamps. Okay, so, so I'm going to go ahead and just guide this so that as I'm pulling it this way, the, the dough is sticking to the surface and it's getting pulled underneath. Does that make sense? So as I scrape it, I'm going to rotate it a little bit and I'm going to let it get pulled underneath. I'm going to do it again, rotate it about a quarter of a turn and then let it pull underneath. I'll do that several times. And what I have now is I've got the top is nice and tight, and underneath is kind of all the extra stuff. Okay? That's going to help make that tight loaf that's going to spring and nice pop on it, and it's clear, what they call it. So that, that will, I'll just keep doing that until that looks, it looks good. And you'll get the hang of it. And there's different techniques that you can use, too. You just choose which one you like. You go on line, you can look them up. Thank you guys. All right. Awesome. Okay. This is. Yes. Linoleum, you put it in or granite. Yeah. You can use it up too. And so linoleum is fine. Um, not concrete. 
Um, this is this is one of the things on your ingredient list. You can use a bowl. When I first started, I just used a bowl and I lined the bowl with a dishcloth, and then I made sure I really flour that dishcloth very well. When you flour this, now you notice that this is not clean. This is the way you want it. After you've used this, you've actually got a lining of whole flour in here, which will keep it from sticking. This is not the same flour I used to make the bread. This is actually preferably rice flour. It doesn't stick very well. It, it really is great because it doesn't let this stick in. The last thing you want is like you can't get this thing off. Like you don't want to bake your bread with this cloth on top, right? <laughs> so, so you want to use a flour. Um, I just it doesn't it doesn't have to be uh, rice flour. Rice flour does work the best. But I, I wanted to give this a go because I couldn't find rice flour at Trader Joe's, so I just did a little bit of this. And all I'm going to do is just just a little dip, just a little dabbing, and then I'm going to go ahead and. It's yeah, it's cauliflower, cassava, cassava flour, cauliflower blend. Yeah. So now I've got some some of that flour on the inside of the of the banneton, I believe the way you pronounce it. And I'm going to go ahead and lift this up and just, just lay it right in there. So you put it in upside down. I put it in upside so the down. Pretty that's side right. is down. Correct, and that's okay. what your recipe talks about. So I want that pinch inside underneath, right? Now I had one in the fridge. And it was all ready to go. <laughs> so, because like you're gonna leave this overnight, and then it's gonna get kind of a little firm, because it's cold, right? And it's also kind of dried out a little bit on the edge, so give it a nice crust. And so after it's you know, rested or slept or whatever you want to call it in the fridge, you're gonna get your parchment paper, and you take it out of the fridge. Take off your now. I, I'm using this thing. It's just an extra liner. I got extra liners from cost or from uh, Amazon. You can use um, just about anything you want um, to cover it. You can use a cloth, you can use saran wrap. Just keep in mind when you use saran wrap, it's going to stay more moist, right? So it's up to you what you'd like to use. I just went ahead and I grabbed some more of those because I like how they're kind of... I'm baking a lot, so it's out of this um, Then I'm going to go ahead and flip this. And now I've got <clears throat> my, my dough that's just about ready to go in the oven. Okay? And it's looking really pretty. Now, there's, there's something that's called a lathe. Now, for the artistic people, this one gets fun. Now, you may notice on my, I've got a signature pattern that I like to make on my look. It's symbolic. It has, it has three um, ears of grain. Now, a wheat is actually a symbolism of the state. People are state, right? Wheat and pears. And then each one of these has seven um, uh, little gears, which symbolize perfection, and I uh, know, pardon me, symbolize holiness, and all three of them is probably perfection for God. So, you know, <laughs> so, anyways, but you can make, and there's there's some amazing patterns. You can actually get like dental floss, and you can do like pat like a grid pattern on your bread, and then you can do all you can go crazy with it, and people are like, oh my gosh, and then you eat it, right? <laughs> <laughs> When you, when you cut the ear, you want to do, at least cut the ear, so you want to do at least that. You want to have it kind of at an angle like this, not like this. And you're just going to slice along one end. And then for me, the pattern I do is just a simple, this, this is like cutting really a lot because it hasn't rested at all. Um, and then the, there you go. Now, this is your Dutch oven. You can use other Dutch ovens if you want. Um, that's fine. You're going to warm this up in your oven. Oh, and by the way, do you need to let this warm up um, on the counter? No. You go straight from the fridge. You don't need to let it warm up on the counter. Yep. You go straight from the fridge. Cut it, slice it up. Put it right in there. This is already in the oven? Yes. I didn't do it as good. But yes. But it does. I, I, I did better in some than others, but yeah, it's just, it's not that hard. It's just slice, 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 and yeah, that'll make a pattern like that. Yeah. Now, if you want to, like I said, you can do a, you can watch YouTube videos for, uh, mm -hmm. they call it, you know, I forgot what they call it, but it's uh, mm -hmm. basically the patterns you can put them in on the bread. And there's this one lady out of some country in Europe who does some amazing uh, patterns, and I tried some of those. And, it's fine, but I just didn't get good at it at all, <laughs> so I stopped. Um, at any rate, so you warm this up. If we look at the uh, if we look at the instructions here. So we're back we're down down to the bake portion, right? Okay. So we've got our, our Dutch oven in 
the oven. We've previewed the oven to 415. The reason why I chose 415 is because if you go higher than 425, this starts to degenerate the, the lining in here. I think it's all rusty. That happened to me. 425 were great, but I, I knocked it down to 415 because I didn't want that. If you guys have like one of those porcelain ones, you can just do it higher if you want. It's fine. Um, <clears throat> so 415, place the dough on the parchment paper side down, the, uh, the seam side down, you score it, and then you go ahead and slide it in. Now you're going to definitely want, unless you would like battle wounds, these are not baking gloves. These baking wounds are actually on um, And I, I did this for a little while with my son, and I didn't stick with it. <laughs> so these are repurposed fencing gloves. But they, I, I'm getting so many scars on my arms, so I had to start using these. At any rate, um, then you're going to go ahead and cover it. Okay? And then you're going to go ahead and bake that covered in the oven. This is already in the oven, right? You're going to bake this covered in the oven for 30 minutes, is what the recipe says. And then who said, can anyone show me or tell me what to do after the 30 minutes? What's the next step? Yeah. Yep, another 20 minutes without the lid. And then, after that, look at this. Now this one was just freshly baked. It came out of the oven before it came out. <laughs> so, this is going to get wrapped up. <laughs> okay, now... <clears throat> How easy is that, right? How much time did it really take? Oh, no, that definitely took time, right? You have to plan. But how much effort did it take to do that? Is that doable? Who feels like they could do this tonight? They could do this. Yeah. 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 Is there anyone that has any questions? I'm, I'm going to talk to you about how to take care of your starter. Yes, Cynthia. Yeah. Yes. If you want to do it with something other than cast iron, I haven't used anything other than the Dutch oven cast iron. I can understand that. If you get it into the oven, I never take mine out of the oven because I don't use it for anything else. But that that might be a solution. Or you can buy you can buy something at least that has long that has a lid. It needs to have the lid to steam it, right? So if you want to try something else, by all means. I just don't know what the results might be. I know online I have seen other people use other methods. So they have like a, a dish with, uh, that they put the, the bread or the dough on, and then they have some kind of a glass cover, um, and that seems to work well. And so you can try it. I just don't don't know how it would go. Yes. You said you did hot dog buns. How do you yeah. do that? Like, how do you mold it? And I did not do good at all at those. Actually, <laughs> I am not an instructor for hot dog buns. I'll tell you that. <laughs> I, I just found a recipe for the um, for the hamburger buns, and they turned out awesome. And they, you just add a few other things in there. And it's so great for sandwiches, too. So you just freeze a whole bunch of them. And then if you want to have a sandwich, you just warm them up and go for it. It's awesome. Okay. Steam oven. Did you guys have a steam oven? Those warm up the, the bread super well, mm -hmm. by the way. Yes? Um, if you have, like, I have an oval Dutch oven, that, would that change That's anything? Fine. And even, the, does it have the spikes on the, on the lids? You know how they have the spikes to the uh, moisture? Does that matter? I have no idea. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, yes. So just real quick, you mix. Yes. Then thirty minutes later, you do the pull and fold, or are you six yeah. hours later, you do the pull and fold. Yes and yes. <clears throat> okay. Yes and yes. So here's the thing about the bulk rise. <clears throat> here's the thing about the bulk rise. Once it's risen, it's about about doubled. You're ready to put it in there. You just want to get two or three pull and stretches in there at least during that time. Some time in there. Does it have to be a specific time? It does not. Some recipes say set your time for 30 minutes, every 30 minutes, go and do it. it. I have done that and I have not done that, and it doesn't make a difference. Okay? You might make a prettier loaf because it's got like more gluten like, alignment, but are we really interested in pretty loaves? If you are, we'll take a big professional class because I'm not <laughs> that bad. Right? Yes? Where did you get your bags from? Yes. Oh, yeah. These ones I got as a sourdough bread bag. I got these on a side, the sourdough bread bag sorry, um, on Amazon. Mm -hmm. And I got 300 of them because I knew I'd use them. They were 45 bucks for family. Mm -hmm. yes. At what point do you add, you know, you've added some things, mm -hmm. rosemary and all that? Okay, you reminded me. I actually prepared for that. So I've got right here some rosemary and garlic that I also sauteed before I came here. And we've got another loaf, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so how about we do that? Okay. So, thank you for reminding me, because I would have forgotten about it completely. So, now I'm going to go ahead and do a loaf that has additives. 
And everyone always asks, and I, this is the first time I've actually done, I've, I've brought the additives. This is where not having flour is particularly important. Because the first thing that I'm going to do is actually spread it out so that I can be able to add the different ingredients within it. Okay. So it's good that you don't have additives. What do you mean? Uh, it's good that I don't have flour on it, oh, oh, okay. is what I meant to say. Um, so I'm going to just spread it out. I'm going to go ahead and add whatever it is I want to add. This is how I made all of those different loaves. And I'm, there, like, there's different ways that you can do this. And like I said, the joy of it is experimentation. You just add what you like to add. It's delicious, right? And then I'm going to go ahead and roll it together. Now I'm kind of using my hands to get it to stick, right? So that it sews it right up. Now what I did with those, and which is also good to do, is do a little bit more right here, and then you can roll it this way. Okay? And then you've got your dough, and then you can go ahead and do your stretch and fold thing, and I'm going to do the best I can without my helpers. <laughs> right? <laughs> and then you put that in the band of time, it's the same deal. Okay? Any other questions? Thank you very much for your helpful room. Appreciate it. Any other questions? There's a question you said really early on about gluten and folks that have gluten intolerance. Uh, a couple questions. There is a test for that, right? And I know some people say that. I'm looking at that. Like, yes. Yeah. So there's a PCD antibody test that you can do that for gluten allergy. So there's a difference between allergy and intolerance. So you can have a sensitivity or an intolerance that does, yeah, that doesn't show up in the blood test. Well, that's the only test for two hours. Okay. And so question number two is, you say that folks that, that maybe have that sensitivity to it or whatever is an allergy to this one, uh, this may not bother them. I don't believe it's, I personally don't believe it's the weakness of the issue. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because okay. there's people with weak sensitivity to the issue. I'm not trying to say that there's some people that don't have an actual weak allergy. And that's where I was mentioning going to somebody to help restore that health. And look at actually addressing that in class. But I'm saying that the majority of people that have issues with gluten, I think it has to be more with the way the bread is made. And that's the reason why they can go to Europe and have no problems. And there's all kinds of gluten that they need. But they can come back here and make issues. Does that make sense? Any other questions? Okay. Um, now, the starter. <clears throat> we need to talk about the caribou starter. You've got, you've got a little, little cup. Do you have any extra? Did everyone get some? Okay, great. All right, awesome. You've got anything. So we'll go ahead and uh, we'll make some of what we're going to do, what you need to do when you get home. So let's, you got a little jar. Put a little rubber band and put it around your jar. Um, and you've got your, your gluten or your uh, starter in you. It looks kind of like snot. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, but I, I, I imagine it probably tastes a little bit like snot. <laughs> Sorry. That's a 13 year old boy <laughs> and you're yes. coming out. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> maybe a, maybe a seven year old boy. <laughs> so, at any rate, I'm going to go ahead and uh, put this in my jar and I'm going to add food to it. Now, you don't have very much in here. This one was full. There's some of them that only have like a fourth full. That's fine. There is billions of little cultures in just a little tiny bit. So you're good with just a small amount. And you want to feed it. You want to feed it so that there's a little bit of starter and a lot of food. And I've had patients that feed it with food without it starting, and then they have this huge thing of starter and no idea what to do with it. Um, when you feed it, I'm going to go ahead and add flour and water. I can add as much as I want. I can add a whole bunch of it, and it's going to double in size and grow um, with all the air in it, right? Um, and when it's doubled, it's, it's really it's to really use, but use it earlier than that, or later than that too, but it's going to be most effective at that point. So when it does that, <clears throat> um, if you don't use it, and you're just like, okay, it doubled, but I, don't, I didn't make bread, and I don't want to do with this, and I've got this thing in my fridge, and it's like growing like it's some monster in my fridge, and I don't know how to handle this, dump the majority of it, dump all of it out, and all you have is a lining in there, and then put more flour and water in there, and then you just fed it. Put it back in the fridge, it'll, it'll last for a week or more. This starter will last for longer than that. I've done it for two weeks. 
and it's it's tired and it's watery, but I, I put I feed it and go back away. So we've got we've got some flour here. So I'm gonna go ahead and make sure I've got this uh, zeroed out. I'm gonna go ahead and put flour. I'm gonna and then I'm gonna put some water of equal amount. So what am I at? 30. I'm gonna add 30 milligrams of water or grams of water. Uh, I got the plate. Not a big deal. Got a little bit more. There we go. <laughs> so, and then we'll just start. I actually have a chopstick for this purpose. I didn't bring one today. It's getting really messy. I'm just trying to see. Okay. Now, because the starter calls for 150, or this recipe calls for 150 grams of starter, then you probably want to do 100 of each. So that way you've got a little bit of extra starter that you have to use this for your bread. Okay. So now that I yes. Sorry, I have a question. So I do have a sourdough starter in my fridge, uh -huh. and it is kind of watery. Uh -huh. If it's watery, if, what do I need to, to do to get it back to this consistency? What you do is you dump out most of it. There's actually recipes that you can use to with your starter. You can make muffins, you can make you know, little pancakes, and there's all kinds of stuff that you can make with them uh, with that starter. But dump out the most of most of it, the majority of it. Then you've got lining of the starter in the jar, and you just add flour and water equal parts. So, you know, 100 grams of flour, 100 grams of water, stir it together. If you want to use it in that day, <clears throat> you don't count it. This starter that you guys have, I, I fed it this morning, but it's uh, okay? So, is it bad to use it if it's liquid? Like, does it not have the same amount effect? Or, because like I said, mine is always more liquidy than this. So, if and you, I just use it. You can use it, and it'll still work. Oh, okay. Um, it'll just probably take longer. Okay. Wow, it's like two <laughs> hours. Did the time just go by really quick? Can you guys remember? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I kept you guys so long. <laughs> I'm so busy with that. Okay. Hey, was, like, does this make sense to everyone? What do you need to keep this covered? Or it'll dry it out. Do you keep it like. Tight covered or loosely covered? I have a lid on it. Like a screw on lid. Okay. Well, tight covered. Well, uh, okay. <laughs> Party on the lid. Yeah. Well, if you keep eating it, like, it'll keep you on the lid. So, um, okay, so this is the question that everybody needs to hear. Okay, so you're asking how often you need to eat it. It depends. If you leave it on the counter, it's warm. And these guys are having a party because they got food. And so, like, yeah, baby. So they're, they're getting it on and they're having a lot of fun. So, so, sorry, sorry. Yeah, all right. So, if we're here, it's going to double up to there by the end of the day. Okay? Now, if you put it in the fridge, it'll grow in the fridge. Um, instead, but a little slower because it's colder. So in the fridge, this will last for a week at, uh, at on the counter it's a day. So if you don't want to feed it very often, if you're going to have to use it for a while, put it in the fridge. And then forget about it. And I do it on Sundays. It's the day I eat my starter. Sometimes it's not actually on Sunday. Like, oh, yeah. yes, this stuff is so forgiving. This starter is great. The last thing you can keep in the fridge. If you keep it in the fridge, it's cold. And these are these are living creatures, and so they, their metabolic rate goes down. And so they like to grow. It doesn't expire after a week. Right. It takes a week to grow. Yeah. Oh, I apologize. I didn't answer the question. But it takes, a, it takes a week to grow. If you want to use it faster, like you do this tomorrow, feed it tonight by the morning time and you're ready to do it. You're ready to do it. Yeah, you can. But, no, but you need to retain it every week. Yes. Like you, you, yeah, every week. If you didn't use it that week, if you decided not to be crazy, you dump it in the trash, right. and you have to feed it again. Yeah. And even if you put it in the fridge, like say day three, you want to cook that day, then you have to pull it out, let it warm up so it doubles, then you can do it. Yeah, that's right. Thank you, Doug. I appreciate that. <laughs> yes. On the handout. Yes. 
Yeah, uh, I would say wait. Thank you. That's a typo. I'll have to fix that. So under number two, on number two it says add equal eight of water and bar. It should say wait. There should be a W there. See, I thought it was eight. No, that's okay. Yeah, thank you for that. Wait, where's that? Does everyone understand oh. now? Add equal yeah. wait. <laughs> yes. And just remember, remember when you just when you, I'll I'll get to you in just a second. Just remember when you're adding your when you're gonna feed your starter. You want a little bit of those bugs, a little bit of those guys, and a lot of food. So if you've got a, if you haven't used your starter, like like Doug was saying, if you haven't used it, you got a, a cup full of starter or a jar full of starter. You've got to dump most of it out. So there's just a little bit of those but of those uh, critters in there. If it's been in there for over a week. If you're, um, if it's been there, um, if you're not going to use it for making bread, well, at any point, like if you if you leave it on the counter. It's going to be ready that end of that day. Um, and if you're not going to use it, you've got to dump most of it out and feed it again. If you put the fridge, if you're not going to use it, you got to dump it out in the, within a week, at the end of the week, and then feed it again. Okay? Yes? Any uh, advice on using whole wheat uh, flour as opposed to just white flour yes. and or rye flour or some yes. other different types of flours? So that's a great question. It's really good to do those types of things because there's more uh, nutritional value to those. Um, I've done that too, and I, I didn't I did do it today, and I apologize. I was planning on it, but I ran out of time. Fresh ground is great if you can do your own fresh ground flour and add that in. I tend to like to do a half and half flour and, and wheat, uh, or flour and uh, white and whole, I need to say, because when you have the whole wheat, just pure whole wheat, with this recipe, for whatever reason, it doesn't rise as much. When you have the half and half, it rises better. Now, there's probably other recipes and other methods that would work better. But I'm not the guy to talk to you about that. So if you want to get into that, that's above my pay scale. Okay. <laughs> Anybody else? How many questions? I was just gonna say two things. Yes. One is you can like add your discard to any baked good. Yeah. Like just stir it up and you can, you know, put a couple spoonfuls in, you know, anything anything. Yeah. Muffins, cookies, like whatever. Absolutely. Um, but then also I was going to say there's a great Instagram account called The Food Nanny. And she is based in Utah, but she does a ton with sourdough. And um, she uses kamut flour, awesome, which is yeah. an Kamut's ancient... Really yeah. yeah awesome. um, and anyway, so yeah. I just wanted to say that. Like, Fantastic. We're, we're out of time. If you have any questions, you can come up to me. I'll be happy to... We, have, we, have, we have an important one. Okay, so important one. Um, that one was fed today. Okay. If you put it in the fridge, you can wait a couple of days. Okay. Um, otherwise, you should feed it right away. But it is best to try to do that today or tomorrow. Okay. okay. Any other questions that's that are right. really important? Oh, yes. Yeah. I don't know if my, my daughter, who does have celiac disease, she's does Oh, wow. I have one over here. Okay, if anyone wants a gluten free starter. Now, this is not a gluten free recipe. Thanks for bringing that up. Yeah, so I mean, you could you could try to use the recipe and yeah. you know to substitute. They have they have one to one. If, if people have been cooking yeah. baking with gluten free okay. types of flour blends, and just make their own. Like some work better than others, but you can definitely try it. Sure, it's, it's an experiment. I, I've, I've never done it before because the whole point for me was to like actually be able to eat things. Right. <laughs> but, um, and respect, I, I'm yeah. not. Yeah. But the, the gluten-free the gluten bread, to be able to do that sourdough is, is really healthy for you. And so, fantastic. Thank you for being there. I really appreciate that. Yeah, there's plenty of things. I would suggest not using this recipe. I've had people try to use this recipe. It did not work well at all. And also, this whole step, you don't have to do the stretch pull technique. You actually just pour it in a, some kind of mold because it can't hold its own shape. So it's a very different animal to do gluten-free if you do gluten-free bread. Okay? All right, so let's wrap off some, some of the bread. Yeah, you, you only got half. I've got dinner. Okay, so some people didn't get a ticket. Oh, you want to get one? You at the end. I'll set you up. You didn't get a ticket. Come up and get one now. Good job. Yeah. 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 He's gonna rock with the pie. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
It's a bread. Not, you're not listening. It's a bread. It's not. If it's a car, we have a thing. But it's not a car. It's a That's your ticket. <laughs> it's 516. That would be bad. It is my ticket. <laughs> 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 Let's have someone else pull. Cheater. Well, now we know that she Awesome. Okay, then you guys are 